Welcome to LA Hug. My name is Deborah Isaac. I'm co-organizer of LA Hug along with Ben Mears, who's also here, and uh, Justin Dykhouse, who couldn't make it today. I'm also a Houdini educator. I teach at Drexel University and the founder of Houdini School. Today we're here with Victor uh, Scarby, and he's going to be talking about HDAs in, in um, Houdini and how they work in Unreal. And so, yeah, Victor, go for it. Awesome. Um, yeah, as Deborah mentioned, I'm uh, 24 years old. Uh, my name is Victor. Uh, and I used my bachelor's on creating HDAs for level generation inside of Unreal Engine. And let me just get screen sharing here. Who am I? Uh, briefly, it's been talked about. I'm Danish. Uh, this will also mean there will be some times where I will stutter or make mistakes. Uh, so if there's short breaks, uh, it's simply because I'm looking for a word. I'm a bachelor student at Trumax Academy based in Copenhagen, and they teach 3D generalists. But during that education, I decided to specialize myself towards Houdini because uh, I believe that's that's where there's most jobs and that's where my passion really lies. Um, what have I done? I've created, um, during a four month project, I've created a game creation tool, uh, for level designing, uh, by using Houdini and Unreal Engine side by side. Um, that meant that I had to be both the technical artist and the creative artist on this pro production. Uh, I've been partnered with, uh, or I had my coworker on this, uh, project as well, who's a programmer and has done his masters on this project as well. And together uh, we've been working on this mobile game. Uh, why did I decide to create this? It was mainly because uh, last year I went to Dadio, which is a Danish semester that teaches game design. And it pulls five educations together in Denmark. And then it combines 20 different people. And then we have to make games together. And this is where I really fell in love with game development and the tools that Houdini could provide for this. So I decided to throw myself out of it and learn the technical aspect of Houdini, um, but I still wanted to maintain my artist. So I did a, I did a mix between the two in this, and it was also just a top of bonus to work with a programmer. So I could learn the pipeline more in game development and learn how to work together with, uh, the programming side of things. Uh, and now let's get into it. And with any luck, I can just switch screens like this. And you should see my Houdini. And before I actually do that, I'll show you what the game is actually about. Um, still in development, so this is just a prototype. But what it does is that I'm creating these different HDAs, and these HDAs are then used to create our levels for us, so we don't have to spend time on that. And the quick gist of the game is essentially a mobile game where you have to complete the map using dominoes. So you drag out lines and you build the dominoes where you want to be. So you can make different tracks uh, to make sure you got the objective and you push them and you fail because you're not good at doing the game design. But um, nonetheless, there's buttons you have to hit to make obstacles go away. So without further ado, if we dive into this and this and let's go into Houdini. So the first thing that I want to create, and I might move my camera if it's in the way, but I'll do my best. The first thing we wanted to do um, was we needed an environment. And I immediately thought, let's go for some buildings because there's a lot of material on this. And we didn't just want to use the tools that was already provided. There's already a labs building tools inside of Houdini. That's really powerful. But I wanted to learn how to create them myself and to really you know, further develop my uh, Houdini skills. So let's dive into it a bit. Um, as you can see, the network is quite big. Uh, and it's one of the things that I also love about Houdini is that you can organize everything. Uh, so you have a clue of what's going on inside. But if we go to the start of the system, it's where the, the BSP brushes are coming into action. And when I say BSP brushes, I mean, these inside of Unreal. Uh, it's a smart system that they have. Um, 
that day you can drag out brushes from your actors out here and you can then use them as inputs inside of your house in my case my house generator or level generators and you can input them into the slots and get a result to something like this and this can save many hours on building assets especially houses in my case because if we're not satisfied with a house we can simply move around the bsp blocks in here uh, in unreal so how's that done in my case since we knew it from the start we wanted this um, it was as you normally do you start with a box uh, you copy that around uh, in my case uh, this system is locked to uh, bsps that are locked in measurements so they had to be two times two meters wide on each side and they had to be either two meters tall or 2.5 meters in my case but i'll go over that further down um so some initializing for the tools uh creating removing uh, the individual pieces and combining them into one is the first step which is also what I've used as a collider for the game asset because it's important to have colliders when they need to interact with things. Uh, from there, this is something that I've um, taken a look at the building generator inside of uh, labs, what they do with their building generator. And this is where I define some of these uh, uh, numbers to use for the measurements. So for example, e between each floor, because I know uh, my assets are two meter tall, I would put two in here for meters. And because I know in our case, I wanted our houses to differentiate between the first floor and the second floor. So the first floor will always be 2.5 meters tall. And this is where they get defined. And this is then resembled here in these points uh, with some Python data, with some Python code that's also been uh, taken and then scalped to so it only uses what we actually need. So there's no unnecessary data flying around. Uh, one of the most, uh, um, we can say one of, one of the things where it differentiates from the other buildings generators is that it's not able to go past two meters on each module. So it can't go 2.2, it can't go 2.2 in height because it's locked to these module measurements. Uh, and that's one of the things that we like to, I'd like to work on, on this thing. But during time uh, and deadlines on the bachelor project, I decided to have them locked as measures and modules. And the next part of the, the system is where the, the flaws are sliced up, if you can say it like that. So it takes the input um, as a bounding box and it then goes through some vector some vector wrangles here uh, until they re reach this point down here where the groups are created for each of their primitive groups so if i go through them uh, just move this window over here so if i go through them like this you can see they are split up into different groups uh, or passes so to say and this is important because i want to have fully control of which assets and which modules goes into which place and that place is down here. And this is where all the initial magic kind of happen. So I know, for example, that in my in, in, in this case of this building, I want to work in curves, uh, mostly because I'm using the um, inside of this, I'll get to this as well, but I'm using the chains up uh, on all of my assets. Uh, so um, I know I needed to work with chains uh, from the get go almost because as mentioned, I didn't know, I knew I didn't have time to create a system that would handle different uh, sized blocks uh, because there's, there was a lot of VEX involved. And uh, as mentioned in also the presentation, uh, I started learning VEX at this program as well, or this bachelor's project as well. So some of it is going to be a bit uh, rough in the VEX coding, but nonetheless. So for each floor, I got an output. So you got the upper roof, you got the lower roof, they got the first floor, last floor, and you get all the other floors if multiple stories uh, are there. And this is where then they are get getting thrown out each to each system. So I'll go through each system one at a time, but the next bit of the system is the walls and windows. And this is where, as you can see, I get the first uh, chainsaw or the first line for my chainsaw. 
where if we dive into it, uh, what it does is that it takes the modules that I have created. Just get in here. So it takes the models that I've created. So in my case, I have two different doors uh, and a switch node because it depends on what I want to use. And then it goes down, create some groups. In this case, I'm creating some small squares or grids in front of them because that I'm going to use later on to create geometry outside of this or different modules, uh, props to scatter around the building. And this is done for each asset uh, that's been modeled. And the way it's been done here is that inside of Houdini, it is then easy for me uh, to change what modules that I have. So if, if, I, if we wanna, for example, we're gonna make a new environment in a new level, and we want all the modules to look different, we would then simply just plop the Unreal assets into these slots here, and we would get an entire different building given that they have the same measurements, of course. So if we pop back in, and this is basically the same procedure that's done for the other floors and for the last floor. And then put back together and with all of these different uh, grids, getting a null node, which I can then get later on the other system to create the geometry uh, that you see inside of the engine is really handy. And if we go over to those objects, objects around the building, uh, it's been done over here. So you can see I'm getting the grids that I've just shown uh, and I'm saving the normals on them and scattering some points instead of the grids because I don't want the grids, I want points and then snapping them so there's not multiple points. Uh, so there's only a point per uh, random window, giving them some seeds values and setting their position. In this case, this is the lower floor. So for these props in here to be on the floor, uh, I'm setting them to zero and exposing some values in which I can tweak in here. So I can, for example, push and rotate for now. Um, and it's a bit of a, uh, it's not purely optimized, uh, and I'd like to be a bit more compli uh, complicated. I'd like to control them using BSB process as well, uh, but I ran out of time. Uh, so you can adjust them uh, transform-wise and rotation-wise inside of uh, Houdini, uh, inside of Unreal, sorry. Uh, let's see if we rotate it as well. Well, that's actually the barrel. So as you can see, it goes fairly quick as well. Uh, it's not much waiting time, so you you can do uh, a lot of uh, artistic decisions uh, fast instead of waiting on feedback the entire time. Uh, and again, same system as the walls. If you don't like the props, you can adjust them uh, to whatever prop you like. Um, it then goes into, uh, then takes the points and feeds them into the switch node, which then takes the modules that are imported, and it then copies them around and here's the it's just a symbol uh moving the points normals uh pushing by normal the points so that's just a simple way to push them back and forth uh from there there's created some collision as well uh because we want our dominoes to actually be able to interact with the buildings if needed to solve a course and then simply just exporting it into Unreal. And we don't need to path any textures because it's using the modules. So that's also really nice. Uh, so if we go back in Unreal, uh, so you can see there's props on the floor. There's props on the second, the other floors, as I call them. Uh, there's both um, sometimes a little flower pot and there is sometimes a balcony, uh, not balcony, sorry, uh, an overhead, I think it's called. And you could argue that this could have been done in the wall, wall modules. Um, but since using a chain node, it would make it pretty repetitive and it wouldn't, it would give less randomized outcomes than by doing it the way I've done. So it's the same as before. I take these grids, push them into the uh, position if needed. Uh, in this case, it isn't. And then here I had to, because it's a square and I wanted it to still have the exact same position. So I carved it up and blasted away the zero point number. So I'll have one number for each window. 
uh, did the same, gave the random seed, hooked it up to the module, and copied it around uh, the different windows given a random seed. So this seed is exposed, of course, in Houdini as well. So it's something if you don't like the seed, you can adjust it. Um, and the same for the overhead. Now, the weakness about this is there's not much artistic control in this because it's purely randomly based uh, on a scatter node. So if, you, if I wanted this bit to have an overhang as well, I'd have to go through uh, some scatter nodes to make that happen. Um, so that's one of the weaknesses of it. Uh, but with that being said, it it works. And since it's from developed for a mobile game, uh, you don't necessarily notice it that much from this height. So it's just there to break the silhouette and kind of give you a feeling that there's been done some love to this building. Back in Houdini we go. And we can move to the posts. So one of the things I immediately want to do was to again break up the silhouette and not have it just being a plain side is I want it there to be poles. And it's these wooden poles that I'm talking about. And this is also one of the reasons it's nice to work with curves because I can then take these curves, uh, creating normals on them, uh, exposing, again, exporting these as null nodes. Uh, and as you can see, there's different outcomes of this. And it's because it's using the, it's not here, it is over here. So I'm using the group uh, curve by corners feature uh, to get the correct normals for the sides. And I want both the inside and outside groups. So I would be able to push the right uh, pole, so to speak. And again, it's done for every floor. Pasting in my pillars, it's called actually. Um, again, something that I could replace inside of Unreal. And then they're pasted throughout by a copy to transform uh, node. And that's how you get the pillars for the system. And as you notice, they don't spawn in these modules. It only spawns where it's, it's actually needed for, for the building to have some realistic support. Uh, from there, we can go through the poss possibly the the worst bit of it all, uh, this is where I struggled quite a bit, uh, the roof section and the roof tiling of this building. Um, this has a few different settings. And so it can either be like this, which I believe is called a gable roof, or it can be a hip roof with the press of a button. And this is what takes the longest to, to generate inside, but you can also have a roof like this. Um, and this is incredibly powerful because uh, it, it it builds around uh, your blocks, as also shown in here. Like it builds perfectly. Uh, this is just a square, so it's not <laughs> that hard to actually do. Um, but yeah, it's it's nice because you don't get any intersecting geometry inside it either. Uh, whereas with the the techniques that I've tried before reaching this was that I'd have a lot of difficulty actually getting tiles tiles to align accordingly. So this was also uh, this entire system uh, I've been getting some help uh, both by an online guy who created a, I think it was a modular uh, a, a same system with this just it was a city builder on Venice which was a really nice read a uh, procedural generation of buildings in Venice and he used this system um, and I thought to myself it would be cool if I replicated it in some sorts. So there's going to be some VEX nodes um, containing a lot of vector math. And I've been walked through this multiple times by my programmer coworker. Uh, but I, I'm going to be honest, and I can't walk you through it because it's something I'm still learning. And But it has pushed me even more to learn VEX and coding in general because it's such a powerful tool now that I can see what it can do. Uh, but let's start. So again, I take the, the input. That, uh, or the output rather of my different floors. And this is the, the lower roof and upper roof. And I feed them into a giant for each loop, which up here uh, prepares the data and 
let me just pick a more interesting shape so we can see what's going on rather than just a square. There we go. And let's pop back up. So up here, uh, there's a lot of prepping uh, or pre-processing rather. Um, and it then gets fed into um, a bunch of vector math, which sets the point groups on the right numbers. Uh, as you can see, there's both convex and concave points. And these are set into uh, point groups, which is helping further along down here. Uh, from other than that, it's a bunch of promoting and getting the right groups to the right places. So in this case, I want the primitive groups to edges because I need to use the edges later on in the system and creating a height based on this poly expand node which is nice so i can get an easy height by just pushing the edge distance in the y direction and again making sure that these groups are maintained throughout the system uh, as you can imagine this is the group for the the top tile of a roof i'm not sure what it's called uh, so i'm sorry but let's call it top tile. And from there, this is where it decides if it is a flat side or a, uh, sorry, a gable roof or a hip roof. And it's done by a lot of vector math that I cannot explain in great detail, so I won't. And I will use that time to go over some more cool assets instead. On the left side here, it then takes uh, each primitive uh, shape or polygon, and it then puts them into a for each loop that uh, does a simple rotate uh, to the XC axis, uh, rotates it again to the C axis, mirrors it back, and it does this for all the pieces. And it's important because I'd like all of the different sides to have the exact same rotation and exact same transform as down here. So they are all placed or projected um, at world zero here and then expand into the grid over here. And this is especially important because I am taking my tile asset here, doing some copying, and let me remove this, doing some copying of both rows and columns. And then I'm actually booleaning this section onto the section of the roof that I want. And from there, it's uh, a transform uh, wrangle with some coding and getting that back to its original position. Uh, and as you can see, it is in the exact same place as it was before. And this is what saved my entire roof part of my production on this house, because it looks insanely cool and it works really fast inside the engine as well, uh, despite the boolean and it's then done for everything here so as you can see the top tiles are missing and that's because it's being done on the other side of the system where it's simply just taking the line making it to an edge group uh, resampling it setting the correct groups and copy to curve and voila top tiles push that back to simple or not from single we should get both the top and bottom roof yes and from there it's pushing them back to their original height to make sure they are actually where they're supposed to be and getting that all over into the final outcome as here and inside the engine you can Let's see if we can showcase it. So we don't want this bottom floor to be flat. And let's see if we can put some roof on this. So we don't want it to be flat. Don't want a fence. And as you can see, it's rather quick. And if we change the flat sides to the gable roof to the hip roof like this so that's how it works in engine um, and it's it is one of the slower things in the house as mentioned but it's also because it's 
taking all these uh, polygons as well. The next bit is the flat part of the roof. So the, the terrace or upper deck, you could might call it. And this is where there is this nice uh, fence going around the building. And the way it's created is the flat surface is simply taking the, the roof sections and doing some poly extruding to give it an interesting shape, uh, unwrapping it, putting a material on it from within Houdini. And for the fence section of the, the system, taking the assets, and this is where I wanted it. So as you can see, it doesn't intersect with the building. And it's something that we obviously don't want. We want it to go around it uh, like a normal fence would do. So this is where I made sure to grab the bounding box of the building uh, and put it into a intersection for each system. So it takes the curve of the lower roof into this intersection analysis, analysis node. And with a switch node, um, that basically says that if any of the points hit it, it will switch to the node. Or there's, the switch node will then go from one to one, uh, from zero to one. So an example of that would be if we template this and we put this on single pass and we find. So it should then go from nothing no issues, no issues. And then here it should not spawn anything. And as you can see, it's switched over to this part um, because it has an intersection of this bit uh, and again, and so on and so on. So again, this is something that's really nice. Uh, so you don't have to worry about intersection uh, when building these things. Uh, and, it's, and it's not needed on the upper roof because uh, you're never going to have anything above it. So there's no way to have any intersection up here um, and that I actually think that is it for the house part of the presentation so inside of Unreal I will just show how this works uh, when you're actually tweaking this so this is easy uh, well it is, it's not easy it's it's I have to have, since it's bound to having uh, two meters times two meters, I have to work with uh, 100 units in here to make sure it snaps correctly. So if I don't like the shape of this building, for example, uh, I could then move it uh, to a different part or add different boxes to get a new outcome of the building. Victor, uh, we actually do have yeah. some questions. Um are using Unreal Engine because you prefer it, but this system also works in Unity? Um, I'm using Unreal Engine because I prefer Unreal Engine. As I'm an artist and not that programming wise, I would have a difficult time inside of Unity, especially creating a game. But I don't see why it shouldn't work in Unity. The only difference is that I would need these boxes, but if you can create boxes in Unity, then I don't see a reason that it should work inside, a, inside of Unity. Mm -hmm. And then the other one is about texturing. Do you have an overview of that? Are you using vertex colors? Um, no, so for the texturing, it's actually, um, I did them inside of Substance Painter. And um, it's because uh, the system that I created is based on asset imports. So the assets would then get fed into uh, Unreal as normal. Uh, and then I can drag these assets in. And because I could drag them in, they keep their textures. So it's also a really uh, nice thing about this is that I can have uh, the textures and I don't have to do any um, vertex texturing or LR vertex coloring uh, at all. I can just simply use Substance Painter, which is nice. Uh, yeah, and, and the reason why it's a bit blurry is uh, my post process and it's because we're aiming for a stylized painted kind of vibe. Uh, Ghibli is, is kind of what we're aimed at at least. So yeah, uh, the BB brushes here. So as you can see over here, there's some uh, tweakings, but let's put this on, not cook and show the brushes. So one of the downsides uh, to the whole thing is that if I wanted to change this to, let's say 250, 250, 
and 450. You can see that they, because they're like this is fine, but if I had it like this, the system would work because the PB, the, the P boxes wouldn't, they're not at the same height, so the system wouldn't recognize it. So it's important that if I wanted this building to be a shape, I would have to move them uh, down to match the height of the of the other things. And this can sometimes be a bit of a hassle, but it's not the worst uh, worst issue to have to deal with. So let's say I wanted this building instead, and we could then cook it. And then we have a new building. Um, and yeah, there's the different different kind of settings for this as well. Um, and yeah, as you see, yeah, this is one of the one of the things I'd like to fix is having control on the doors uh, and where they spawn and stuff. I have a seed, but again, it's it's random, so it's not necessarily easy to fix. But it's it's a small problem for what we've what I've got here. Now, this isn't a level generation system. Um, however. I will bring up the PowerPoint again. And I mentioned I worked with a programmer doing this production. And while I was doing the the artwork and the 3D things as the Houdini generations, uh, he created an algorithm that basically worked together with my uh, Houdini assets. And our idea was that we wanted a, a level generator. And this was used by creating trees uh, along uh, B, B, uh, again, the, the the brushes, the BSP brushes inside of Unreal. So it will create a spine, so to say, for each point with a selected branch length. And it will then create a brush, a box that was to these parameters. And it would we then have different uh, exposed parameters. So you can get different branches, like chances for the branch having one child, two child, three childs, etc. And it would look something like this. So he would then, I would then take this input uh, and I'll go over that if time allows uh, on the level generation part. And I would take this input and feed it into creating an actual level. It's based on the Piet Mondrian rectangle generation, if any of you is interested. And it, it basically gives us a selection of squares and it's a simple, simplified version of it because mentioned that we had to adhere to the two times two meter grid due to the measurements of our um, assets. But this then using this, so let's say I would get this square and this square, that would then be my house. So it would take these different squares and divide them up into parts that would be two times two, and it would then feed that into the level generation system. And it would look something like this. Uh, so this would then be, the green lines would be the house generation, and the blue lines would be where the square has been uh, cut out of the overall uh, generation. Now, how does this look in the engine? It looks something uh, like this. So this is an empty level. As you can see, uh, there's a curve here. There's a development uh, in progress UI for this tool. Uh, if we create simply, if we untick these HDAs and just create a level, you can see that the algorithm creates uh, a game level for the dominoes to be put, and it creates the house assets or the, the buildings for the assets that the houses can use. And this is where you can also, um, this is one of the things that we're struggling with because the pivots are getting rotated a bit. Uh, so they're hard to actually uh, fix, but let's say we wanted to move this here. This is where you can really design what buildings goes on in the level generation before you actually cook it. Um, and again, the same, same vice versa with the, if there's something you don't like about this, that there's too many edges or something like that, you're free to, to simply just adjust it. Uh, so the level designers can work quickly and create a nice view before building it. So let's take them on and press build. And this is this takes anywhere from 30 seconds to a minute, depending on the map size, but it's still faster than actually building a level from scratch.
If any questions, this is a good time as well while we're waiting for the cook. I can also, in the meanwhile, open up the project for the level generation. It doesn't look as neat and tidy like this because it was the end of pro pro the production and the deadline was pressing. So if it's a bit messy in here, do not judge. <laughs> and let us see if it has done anything. So now you can see the, the level generation has been built uh, and it's using different. So as you saw, there was a curve and that's what the main platform is kind of built around. And then inside this curb, curb part is the BSP brushes. The reason we're using a curve is simply because we wanted to show that this can also be used. Uh, it does work with BSP brushes if you just wanted uh, a giant square just being a map, uh, but it takes curves. And this is kind of what we wanted to showcase as well. So this is what his algorithm does. It creates creates all the BSP blo bro blocks and curves for us. And I create the HDAs, which then gets input into the, into the system. Uh, and as you can see, you have a interesting house here, which is cool. Cause then we can just, if we don't like, uh, let's say in this case, I wouldn't want the doors to be like this, uh, cause they would overhang too much. So just simply press, press here and we would get Get a new house with new doors, which is really cool. So speaking of the level generation, it is looking like this, which doesn't look like much in here. Um, there's no trees and rocks, but that's simply because they're getting added inside of the engine. Uh, I haven't actually added them in here yet, but it's something that I would do so you, you can get um, so you can get more visual in here. Um, but let's start from the curb part of the system. And this is where it takes the BSP brushes. So I tried, cause I, again, um, this was made like back and forth early versions of it. Uh, and we knew again, we wanted to use B, uh, BB brushes. So I had to replicate it by just creating a bunch of boxes, uh, overlapping cause that's what they're going to do inside the engine as well and making sure that it works. And the best way I found was simply voxelizing it. Um, which is a bit, it, it can take a bit of, like sometimes it's a heavy procedure. Uh, a different mes method would be scattering uh, and then making the mesh after that. Uh, but I, I couldn't really find a difference in creating them. So I simply used a voxel mesh, cleaning the mesh up by splitting it, making sure that we have some actual game ready mesh so, so we don't have millions of polygons on ground alone. Transferring the data to over here. So we have the exact same shape and this is where the curves gets generated. So getting that into a line, making sure the, the normal directions are correct. And then from there inside here, it has chosen the very small shape, but it takes that curve and it basically just extrudes uh, a polygon along it, uh, exposing both parameters for width and height. Uh, so we have some control uh, and the bevel as well, if you want it to get a bit uh, more stylized in a way. Getting it down as well in game rush, so it's not too hard. Uh, also exposed if we want it to be really optimized. Creating a collider, because of course we need the colliders for the, the dominoes, so they know where not to go. Uh, I think we can also... So this is the navigation mesh, and it's that's based around the colliders. So the blue lines would be the colliders for this mesh and the, the nav mesh or the green bit is where the domino lines could be built. And it's important that the colliders are correct. Otherwise this nav mesh would not, uh, or the, the, the track would not be able to be built inside. So it's important to have the colliders ready and optimized. So you don't have a lot of data getting wasted on saving colliders and stuff like that. Uh, again, instancing it. In this case, we wanted it to be instanced uh, separately rather than all together. Giving it a material from in here. 
stuff like that. Uh, the ground is up here, and this is where, again, unwrapping it, uh, and for up here, uh, giving it a, as low as re res as we can kind of get away with to create colliders, uh, and simply just extruding it. So we, because you can't, we can't really use a plane uh, collider for anything. So we wanted a, a proper geometry collider. Uh, it's just done by making a group. Uh, naming it appropriately to the Unreal documentation on the colliders. And that's the ground basically for the curb, the curb system. The platform. So this is where uh, inside of Houdini, I'm just using boxes uh, to start with, but then we switch to the curve system. Uh, as mentioned, it works on both. And it's the same procedure of getting that uh, into the primitive shape and then cleaning it up. And then taking that, as you can see, it's a bit of a messy node system, but taking that over to this side where it, no, that's, that's yeah. So if, if it's BSP brushes, it goes through this system. And if it's curves, it goes through this. They do the same, they, they snip them up so there are only curves in the same shape as the ground. Uh, basically the same system as the curves. The only difference is that there is some geometry placed on each corner. And that is, again, just the group curve corners with the normals. Uh, attaching my mesh to it and then being placed on each corner. Uh, and in case there's multiple being placed the same place, I've placed an intersection analysis to just remove them. So there's always only one copy. And that is to give it this whole uh, kind of waterfront harbor vibe with the giant wooden poles that kind of holds the whole sh platform into shape in the water. And again, some colliders, making sure that works. And in this case, I'm using a different technique, which is for annoy and then convexing it to get some colliders. I don't actually think these colliders are needed because we, at the moment, don't get outside of this place. We only kind of play inside of this area. So that is something that should take a look at probably. Uh, prepping the geometry, giving everything the materials inside of Unreal and exporting it. So we had the platforms, we had the the curbs, but we kind of lacked an environment and we had the houses, but it kind of seemed empty. So what we wanted is we wanted to create some rocks and trees. Uh, and as you've seen here, uh, it helps a bit on the barren environment. So the way we did that, or I did that was I took the main grid of the curb platform and the house BSP input boxes. And I then color them in this case, black, and then scatter that, or sorry, not scattering. This is hard to see the lines on this color. Taking the main platform uh, and then transferring the color from the curb platform and the BSP brushes to the main platform and removing it. And this means that I would have some scattering info in which I can use to place the rocks and trees. So I don't get them because I don't want any geometry uh, on the track of the dominoes. I only want them where there's no houses and there's no curb. Uh, and some standard things, some scattering, exposing some seeds, uh, blasting a few of them away so they're not too heavy and giving the material, clipping them where the plane is so there's no uh, geometry that's being rendered for no reason and exporting it again instancing in this case so they have their own uh, when they get baked they have their own mesh and it's the same for the trees this is just going to be empty because the trees are getting spawned inside of uh, unreal but it's the same procedure uh, the only thing that's been made difference is the intersection bit because i had issues where it didn't work purely based on this bit so I added the B boxes in here, 
uh, remesh them so they would have some information and then placing a, a bunch of uh, cuts in it inside of the building so the trees know that okay if, I, if I'm inside the building uh, I shouldn't spawn and that's basically uh, what this little system does so it makes sure that no trees get spawned inside or hits the house in any way so you can still get trees close to the house which is nice but you can't get trees that are inside of the house and from there it is done on this on this part and let me just check because i'm actually done with the presentation on the hdas but if any luck i can show the puzzle generation without crashing this because i'm sitting because we're currently building for mobile so we have split the project up into a different branch while working so i could showcase something without it breaking but let's yeah so this is a part of his algorithm and it evaluates the levels with these red lines and it tells the different interactive elements of the track where you can build and and places assets along these lines and then when it's all baked you can you can then ideally play it and i think that's that's all from my side uh, i hope you've enjoyed uh, what i've had to show